Chapter 3 Toscana A command rang across the parade ground, and Will watched the roof of shields disappear as the legionnaires lowered them back to their normal position. Then, in response to another command, the second and third ranks took a pace backwards. Each man carried a long javelin in addition to the short sword he wore on his right side. Now the men in the rear rank reversed their grip, turned side on, and raised the javelins to the throwing position. Right arms extended back, the javelins balanced over their right shoulders, aiming upwards at an angle of about 40 degrees. Azione! Thirty-three right arms came forward, thirty-three right legs stepped into the cast, and the flight of javelins arced away towards the wooden targets. They were still on their way when the second rank repeated the action, sending another 33 projectiles soaring. There was no individual aim. Each man simply cast his weapon at the mass of targets in front of him. Will realised that in a real battle, the optimum distance would be decided by the sentry commander who was calling the orders. The first volley arced up, then pitched down as the heavy iron heads of the javelins overcame the force of the throw. There was a rolling, splintering crash as the javelins hit home. Half of them struck the ground harmlessly. The other half smashed into the light wooden targets, knocking them to the ground. A few seconds later, the second flight arrived, with similar results. Within the space of a few seconds, nearly a third of the hundred targets had been splintered and demolished. Interesting, Holt said softly. Will glanced quickly at him. Holt's face was impassive, but Will knew him well. Holt was impressed. The first blow is often decisive, Sapristi told them. Warriors who have never fought their legions before are shaken by this sudden devastation. I can imagine, Selethan said. He was watching keenly, and Will guessed that he was imagining those lethal javelins crashing into a company of his light cavalry at full gallop. But today, for the sake of a demonstration, our enemy will be overcome with rage and will go on with the attack, the general continued. As he spoke, the wild mass of enemy warriors moved up to the point where the targets had been savaged and splintered. Now they brandished their swords and charged at the wall of shields. The solid crash as they hit the wall carried clearly to the observers. The front rank swayed a little under the initial impact. Then it steadied and held fast. Looking carefully, Will could see that the second row had closed up and were actually pushing their comrades forward supporting them against the initial impact of the charge. The tribesmen's swords flailed in swinging arcs at the big square shields. But for the most part, they were ineffective, and they were getting in each other's way. By contrast, the short wooden practice swords of the legionnaires began to flicker in and out like serpents' tongues through narrow gaps in the shield wall and the observers could hear the shouts of rage and pain from the attackers. The demonstration might be using blunt wooden weapons, but those jabbing impacts would be painful, and the legionnaires weren't holding back. How can they see? Will asked. The men in the front rank were crouched low behind the barrier formed by their shields. They can't see very well, Sapristi told him. They see an occasional leg or arm or torso through the gaps, and they stab out at them. After all, a man hit on the thigh or arm is rendered as ineffective as a man stabbed through the chest. Our troops just plough forward, jabbing and stabbing at anything they see on the other side of their shields. That's why your men don't need to be expert swordsmen, Will said. The general smiled appreciatively at him. That's right. They don't have to learn any advanced techniques of strike and parry and riposte. They just stab and jab with the point of the sword. It's a simple technique to learn, 
and a few centimeters of the point does just as much damage as a wide, sweeping blow. Now, watch as the second rank add their weight to the advance. The perfectly aligned front rank was edging slowly forward, crowding the enemy and forcing them back. Now the second rank suddenly rushed forward, once more adding their weight and impetus to those of the men in front of them, and the extra drive sent the enemy staggering back, buffeted and shoved by the huge shields, jabbed and harassed by the darting short swords. Then, having gained a brief respite, the formation stopped. A long whistle blast rang out, and the second rank turned in place so that they stood back to back with the front rank. Another signal on the whistle, and the front rank pivoted to their left, while the second rank pivoted right. Each pair of men stepped in a small half circle. Within a few seconds, the front rank had been replaced, all at once, by the fresh men from the second rank. The former front rankers passed back through the third rank, who took their place behind the new front row. The attackers now faced totally fresh opponents, while the former front rank had a chance to recover and redress their losses. That's brilliant, Will said. Sapristi nodded at him. It's drill and coordination, he said. Our men don't need to be expert sword masters. That takes a lifetime of training. They need to be drilled and to work as a team. Even a relatively unskilled warrior can be effective in those conditions. And it doesn't take long to learn. Which is why you can maintain such a large army, Holt said. Sapristi switched his gaze to the older ranger. Exactly, he replied. Most countries maintained a relatively small standing force of expert warriors as the core of their army, calling on less skilled men-at-arms to fill out the numbers in time of war. The Toscans, however, needing to maintain order in their spreading empire, had to have a large permanent army on call at all times. Selathan fingered his chin thoughtfully. His left hand had strayed unconsciously to the hilt of his sabre as he watched. Sapristi glanced at him, pleased to see that the demonstration had had a sobering effect on the Aridi leader. It didn't hurt, Sapristi thought, for Toscana's new ally to appreciate the might of the Toscan legions. Let's go take a look at the results, Sapristi said. He rose and led the way down from the reviewing platform to the parade ground, where the two forces, the demonstration now complete, had drawn apart. The legionnaires still stood in their measured rows. The attacking force milled about in a loose group. We had the practice swords dipped in fresh paint so we could measure results, Sapristi told them. He led the way to the enemy group. As they drew closer... Holt and Will could see arms, legs, torsos and necks splattered with red blotches. The marks were testimony to the number of times the legionnaire's wooden swords had found their mark. The attacker's longer swords had been coated with white paint. Looking now, the Araluans could see only occasional evidence that these swords had struck home. There were crisscross patterns and random splotches of white on the shields and some of the brass helmets of the legionnaires, but the majority of men in the century were unscathed. Very effective, Selathan told the general. Very effective indeed. Already, his agile mind was at work, figuring ways to counteract a force of heavy infantry such as this. Holt was obviously having similar thoughts. Of course, you've chosen perfect conditions for heavy infantry here, he said, sweeping an arm around the flat, open parade ground. In more constricted country, like forest land, you wouldn't be able to manoeuvre so efficiently. Sapristi nodded in acknowledgement. True, he said, but we choose our battlefields and let the enemy come to us. If they don't, we simply invade their lands. Sooner or later, they have to face us in the battle. 
Will had wandered away from the group and was studying one of the javelins. It was a crude weapon, he saw. The square wooden shaft was only roughly shaped, just a very ordinary, minimally dressed piece of hardwood. The point was equally utilitarian. It was a thick rod of soft iron, about half a metre long, hammered flat at the end and sharpened into a barbed point. A groove had been cut down one side of the shaft and the head had been slotted into it and bound in place with brass wire. Sapristi saw him looking at it and walked over to join him. They're not pretty, he said, but they work. And they're easy and quick to make. In fact, the soldiers can make their own in a pinch. We can turn out thousands of these in a week, and you've seen how effective they can be. He indicated the rows of smashed and splintered targets. It's bent, Will said critically, running his hand along the distorted iron head. And it can be straightened easily and used again, the general told him. But that's actually an advantage. Imagine one of those hitting an enemy's shield. It penetrates and the barb holds it in place. Then the head bends so that the handle is dragging on the ground. Try fighting effectively with nearly two meters of iron and wood dragging from your shield. I assure you, it's not an easy thing to do. Will shook his head admiringly. It's all very practical, isn't it? It's a logical solution to the problem of creating a large and effective fighting force, Sapristi told him. If you pitted any of these legionnaires in a one-on-one battle against a professional warrior, they would probably lose. But give me a hundred unskilled men to drill for six months, and I'll back them against an equal number of warriors who've been training in individual combat skills all their lives. So... It's the system that's successful, not the individual, Will said. Exactly, Sapristi told him. And so far, nobody has come up with a way to defeat our system in open battle. How would you do it? Holt asked Selethan that night. The negotiations had been finalised, agreed, signed and witnessed. There had been an official banquet to celebrate the fact, with speeches and compliments on all sides. Now Selethan and the Araluan party were relaxing in the Araluan's quarters. It would be their last night together as the Wakir was due to leave early the following morning. Selethan had brought some of the trade gift cafe with him, and he, Will and Holt, were all savouring the brew. Nobody, Will thought, made coffee quite as well as the Aridi. Alice sat by the fireplace, smiling at the three of them. She liked coffee, but for rangers, and apparently the Aridi, coffee drinking was close to a religious experience. She contented herself with a goblet of fresh, citrus-tasting sherbet. Simple, said Selethan. Never let them choose the conditions. As Sapristi said, they've never been defeated in open battle. So you need to fight a more fluid action against them. Catch them when they're on the move and in file. Hit them on the flanks with quick raids before they can go into their defensive formation. Or use artillery against them. That rigid formation makes for a very compact target. Hit it with heavy bolts from a mangonel or rocks from catapults and you'd start to punch holes in it. Once it loses cohesion, it's not so formidable. Holt was nodding. I was thinking the same, he said. Never confront them head on. If you could get a force of archers behind them without their realising it, their tortoise formation would be vulnerable. But of course, he continued, they rely on their enemy's sense of outrage when they invade a country. Very few armies will have the patience to carry out a running battle, harassing and weakening them over a period. Very few leaders would be able to convince their followers that this was the best way. National pride would force most to confront them, to try to force them back across the border. And we saw what happens when you confront them, Will said. Those javelins are effective. Both the older men nodded. Limited range, however, 
Selathan said, no more than thirty or forty metres. But quite deadly at that range, Holt said, agreeing with Will. It seems to me, said Alice cheerfully, that the best course to take would be one of negotiation. Negotiate with them rather than fight with them. Use diplomacy, not weapons. Spoken like a true diplomat, Holt said, giving her one of his rare smiles. He was fond of Alice, and her bond with Will made him even more inclined to like her. She bowed her head in mock modesty. But what if diplomacy fails? Alice rose to the challenge without hesitation. Then you can always resort to bribery, she said. A little gold in the right hands can accomplish more than a forest of swords. Her eyes twinkled as she said it. Selathan shook his head in admiration. Your Araluan women would fit in well in my country, he said. Lady Alice's grasp of the skills of negotiation is first class. I recall you weren't quite so enthusiastic about Princess Evelyn's negotiating skills, Holt said. I have to admit, I met my match there, he said ruefully. In his previous encounter with Araluans, he had tried to bamboozle Evelyn in their haggling over a ransom payment for Obial Irak. The princess had remained totally unbamboozled and had very neatly outwitted him. Alice frowned slightly at the mention of Evelyn's name. She was not one of the princess's greatest admirers. However, she recovered quickly and smiled again. Women are good negotiators, she said. We prefer to leave all the sweaty, unpleasant details of battle to people like your... She was interrupted by a discreet knock at the door. Since this was a diplomatic mission, she was in fact the leader of the Araluan party. Come in, she called in reply, then added in a lower voice to the others, I wonder what's happened. After all, it is a little late for callers. The door opened to admit one of her servants. The man glanced nervously around. He realised he was interrupting a conversation between the head of the mission, two rangers, and the most high-ranking representative of the Aridi party. Oh, my apologies for interrupting, Lady Alice, he began uncertainly. She reassured him with a wave of her hand. It's perfectly all right, Edmund. I assume it's important. The servant swallowed nervously. Oh, you could say so, my lady. The Crown Princess Cassandra has arrived, and she wants to see you all.